This is Audible. Asset Digital presents Death in a White Tie by Nio Marsh. Read by Benedict Cumberbatch. Roderick, said Lady Alain, looking at her son over the top of her spectacles. I am coming out. Out? repeated Chief Detective Inspector Alain vaguely. Out to where, Mama? Out of what? Out into the world. Out of retirement. Out into the season. Out, dear me, how absurd a word becomes if one says it repeatedly. Out! Alain stared at his mother. What can you be talking about? I'm going to do the London season. I've told George and Grace that I will bring Sarah out. Good Lord, Mama, you must be demented. Do you know what this means? It means I must take a flat in London. It means that I must look up all sorts of people who will turn out to be dead or divorced or remarried. It means that I must give little luncheon parties and cocktail parties. It means that I must sit in ballrooms praising other women's granddaughters and securing young men for my own. I shall be up until four o'clock, five nights out of seven, and in addition to buying clothes for Sarah, I shall have to buy some for myself. And I should like to know what you think about that, Roderick. I think it's all utterly preposterous. Why the devil can't George and Grace bring Sarah out themselves? Because they are in Fiji, darling. Well, why can't she stay in until they return? George's appointment is for four years. In four years, your niece will be twenty-two. An elderly sort of debutant. And a girl has such fun doing her first season. I've heard this morning from Evelyn Carados. She was Evelyn O'Brien, you know. Her mother was my greatest friend. We did the season together when we came out. And now here's Evelyn bringing her own girl out and offering to help with Sarah. Could anything be more fortunate? Alain lit his mother's cigarette in his own. He walked over to the French window and looked across the lawn. Your garden's getting ready to come out too, he said. I wish I hadn't to go back to the yard. Now, darling, this minute? Afraid so. Fox rang up late last night. Something's cropped up. What sort of case is it? Blackmail. Lord Robert Gospel. Bunchy! Surely he's not being blackmailed. No, Mama. nor is he a blackmailer. He's a dear little man, said Lady Alain emphatically. Not so little nowadays. He's very plump, wears a cloak and a sombrero. You must have seen photographs of him in your horrible illustrated papers. Lord Robert Bunchy Gospel tells one of his famous stories, that sort of thing. Yes, but what's he got to do with blackmail? Nothing. Roderick, don't be infuriating. Are you meeting him today? I think so. Why? Why, darling, to listen to one of his famous stories, I suppose. It was Miss Harris's first day in her new job. She was secretary to Lady Carrados and had been engaged for the London season. She was a competent young woman with a brain that was divided into neat pigeonholes and a mind that might be said to label all questions answered or unanswered. Miss Harris tapped twice, not too loudly and not too timidly, on a white door. Come in, cried a voice. Miss Harris obeyed and found herself in a large white bedroom. A white bearskin rug nearly tripped Miss Harris up as she crossed the floor to the large white bed where her employer sat propped up with pillows. The bed was strewn with notepaper. Oh, good morning, Miss Harris, said Lady Carrados. Evelyn Carrados was thirty-seven years old and on her good days looked rather less. She was a dark, tall woman with a beautiful pallor. Paddy O'Brien had once shown her a copy of the Madonna de San Sisto, and had told her that she was looking at herself. Paddy had taken to calling her Donna after that, and Bridget, his daughter, who had never seen him, called her mother Donna too. I see you've brought up my mail, Lady Carrados said. Yes, Lady Carrados, I, I did not know if you would prefer me to open or— No, 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 please not. I know I'm not behaving a bit as one should when one is lucky enough to have a secretary, but I'm not used to such luxuries, and I still like to pretend I'm doing everything myself. So I shall have all the fun of opening my letters and all the joy of handing them over to you, which is very unfair, but you'll have to put up with it, poor Miss Harris. She watched her secretary smile. 
Soon Miss Harris began to make shorthand notes of the answers she was to write for her employer. Oh yes, now this is most important. It's from Lady Allen, who is a great friend of mine. One of her sons is a deadly baronet, and the other is a detective. Do you know, Chief Inspector Allen, Lady Carrados, the famous one? That's it. Terribly good-looking and remote. This letter is about his brother George's girl, whom his mother is bringing out. Sarah Allen is to be asked to everything, and Lady Allen to the mother's lunches. There's her address. Oh, and remind me to write personally now. She stopped so suddenly that Miss Harris glanced up. Lady Carrados was staring at a letter which she held in her long white fingers. The fingers trembled slightly. She put the letter aside quickly and picked up another. Miss Harris made notes for the acceptance, refusal, and issuing of invitations to Lady Carrados's ball. I'm getting Dmitri, the Shepherd Market caterer, to do the whole thing. Well, he is best," agreed Miss Harris. "Dmitri works out at about twenty-five shillings a head, but that's everything. Twenty-five, four hundred, they'll be, I think. And then there's the band, and I do think we must have champagne at the buffet. Champagne will mean thirty shillings a head. I should think a thousand pounds would cover the whole of the expenses, band and everything. A thousand," said Lady Carrados. There was a tap at the door, and a voice called, "Donna." Come in, darling. A tall, dark girl came into the room. Bridget was very like her mother, but nobody would have thought of comparing her to the Sistine Madonna. She had inherited too much of Paddy O'Brien's brilliance for that. Miss Harris returned Bridget's punctilious good morning and watched her kiss her mother. "Hello, my darling," said Lady Carrados. "Miss Harris and I have decided on the eighth for your dance. Uncle Arthur writes that we may have his house. That's General Marsden, Miss Harris." The door opened again, and Sir Herbert Carrados limped into the room. He was tall and soldierly and good-looking, and had thin, sandy hair, a large guardsman's moustache, heavy eyebrows, and rather foolish light eyes. He was not, however, a stupid man, but only a rather pompous one. During the Great War, he had held down a staff appointment of bewildering unimportance, which had kept him in Tunbridge Wells for the duration. And which had not hampered his sound and at times brilliant activities in the city. Bridget called him Bart, which he rather liked, but he occasionally surprised a look of irony in her eyes, and that he did not at all enjoy. What are your plans for today, darling? Sir Herbert asked, smiling at his wife. Oh, everything. Bridget's dance. Miss Harris and I are going into expense, Herbert. Ah,、oh, yes, murmured Sir Herbert. What's the total, Miss Harris? About a thousand pounds. Good God! Exclaimed Sir Herbert. Darling, began his wife. It just won't come down to less, even with Arthur's house. And if we have champagne at the buffet, I can't see the smallest necessity for champagne at the buffet, Evelyn. I do not understand the mentality of modern youth. Gambling too much, drinking too much, no object in life. Look at that young Potter. If you mean Donald Potter, said Bridget dangerously, I. Bridget, darling," said Lady Carrados. "Breakfast." "Sorry, Donna," said Bridget. "All right." She went out. "I know Paddy would have meant some of Bridget's money to be used for her coming out, Herbert." "My dear," said Herbert, "it's entirely for you and Bridget to decide. Just rather an old fool, and I like to give any help I can. Don't pay any attention." Lady Carrados was saved the necessity of making any reply by the entrance of the maid. Lord Robert Gospel has called my lady and wonders if. Morning, Evelyn," said an extraordinarily high-pitched voice outside the door. "I've come up. Do let me in." "Banshee!" cried Lady Carrados in delight, and Lord Robert Gospel, panting a little under the burden of an enormous bunch of daffodils, toddled into the room. On the same day that Lord Robert Gospel called on Lady Carrados, Lady Carrados called on Sir Daniel Davidson in his consulting rooms in Harley Street. At the end of half an hour, she sat staring rather desperately into his large black eyes. "There is nothing specifically wrong with you," said Davidson, "but you are altogether too tired. Have you got any particular worry?" There was a long pause. "Yes," said Evelyn Carrados. But I can't tell you about that. She rose, and he at once leapt to his feet. "You will get that prescription made up at once," he said, glaring down at her. "And I should like to see you again. I suppose I'd better not call." "No, please. 
I'll come here. Lady Carrados left him, longing devoutly for her bed. Agatha Troy pulled her smart new cap over one eye and walked into her one-man show at the Wiltshire Galleries in Bond Street. It always embarrassed her intensely to put in these duty appearances at her own exhibitions. People felt they had to say something to her about her pictures, and they never knew what to say, and she never knew how to reply. In a corner of the crowded room, sitting on a chair that was not big enough for him, Troy saw a smallish, round gentleman whose head was aslant, his eyes closed, and his mouth peacefully open. Troy made for him. Bunchy? Lord Robert Gospel opened his eyes. Hello, he said. Oh, what a scrimmage, ain't it? Pretty good. You were asleep. I had a good prowl first, explained Lord Robert. Enjoyed myself. He had an odd trick of using Victorian colloquialisms, legacies he would explain from his distinguished father. He twinkled through his glasses. Come and have tea. I'd love to. I've got the potters, said Bunchy. You know, my sister and her boy, Mildred and Donald. They live with me now, since poor Potter died. Donald's just been sent down for some gambling scrape. No harm in him, only don't mention Oxford. I remember. Lord Robert's widowed sister came billowing through the crowd, followed by her extremely good-looking son. She greeted Troy breathlessly. Donald bowed, grinned, and said, Oh, I say, I say, the distinguished artist in person. We have been enjoying ourselves frightfully good. There's a restaurant down below, squeaked Lord Robert. Follow me, though I'm afraid I must be rather quick. I've an appointment in twenty minutes. Where, said Troy, I'll drive you. Matter of fact, said Lord Robert, it's at Scotland Yard, meeting an old friend of mine called Alain. Lord Robert Gospel to see you, Mr. Alain, said a voice in Alain's desk telephone. Bring him up, please, said Alain. Lord Robert entered, twinkling and a little breathless. Hello, Roderick. How do you do? Hello, Bunchy. This is extraordinarily good of you. Not a bit. Afraid I'm a bit late. Took tea with a delightful woman, Agatha Troy. Did you look after that case where her model was knifed? Charming, ain't she? There was a short silence. Yes, said Alain. She is. Lord Robert looked sharply at him. Now, what about business? What's up? We rather think blackmail, said Alain. He laid a thin hand on a file in front of him. This is rather more than usually confidential, Bunchy. You know Mrs. Halkett Hackett, old General Halkett Hackett's wife? Yes, American actress, twenty years younger than H.H., H. gorgeous creature. She came to us last week, told us that a very great woman friend of hers had confided that she was being blackmailed. Mrs. X, who has an important husband, received a blackmailing letter written on Woolworth paper. The writer said he or she had possession of an extremely compromising letter written to Mrs. X by a man friend. The writer was willing to sell it for £500. Mrs. X's account has gone into very thoroughly every month by her husband, and she was afraid to stump up. In her distress, she flew to Mrs. Halkett Hackett, who couldn't provide five hundred pounds, but persuaded Mrs. X to let her come to us with the whole affair. She gave us the letter. Here it is. Alain laid the file on Lord Robert's plump little knees. If you would care to buy a letter dated April 20th, written from the Bucks Club, addressed to Darling Dodo, and signed M, you may do so by leaving five hundred pounds in notes of small denomination in your purse behind the picture of the Dutch funeral above the fireplace in the ballroom of Comstock House on the evening of next Monday fortnight. Lord Robert looked up. That was the night the Comstocks ran their charity bridge party. It was. We saw the Comstocks, told them a fairy story, and asked them to let us send in a man dressed as a waiter. We asked Mrs. H. H. to get her distressed friend to put the purse full of notes, which we dusted with the usual powder, behind the Dutch funeral. Mrs. H. H. said she would save her friend much agony by doing this office for her. Poor thing, said Lord Robert. Did she suppose she'd taken you in? I don't know. I kept up a polite pretense. Our man was there all night and saw a maid discover the bag next morning, put it unopened on the mantelpiece and call Mrs. Comstock's attention to it. And what, asked Lord Robert, what do you deduce from that, my dear Roderick? They rumbled our man. 
Mm. This is one of the Comstock servants. The whole show was done by Dimitri, the shepherd market caterer. He does most of the big parties nowadays. One of Dimitri's men. We've made extremely careful inquiries. They've all got splendid references. I've spoken to Dimitri himself. I told him that there had been one or two thefts, and we were bound to make inquiries. He got in no end of a tig, of course. He has a strict rule that all objects left lying about at these shows should be brought to him. He then looks to see if he can find the owner, and in the case of a lost purse or bag, returns it in person. He always asks the owner to examine a bag the moment it is handed to her. Dimitri himself? Alan grimaced. Yes, yes, of course. He's a bit too grand for those capers. Anything else? We've been troubled by rumours of blackmail from other sources. Briefly, they all point to someone who works in the way suggested by Mrs. Halkett Hackett, alias Mrs. X. Where do I come in? asked Lord Robert. Everywhere. You've helped us before, and we'll be damn glad if you help us again. You toddle in and out of all the smart houses. Lovely ladies confide in you. Heavy colonels weep on your bosom. See what you can see. Can't break confidences, you know. Supposing I get them. Of course you can't, but you can do a little quiet investigation on your own account and tell us as much as a man of integrity may. Will you? Love to, said Lord Robert. Matter of fact, Roderick, I called on Evelyn Carrados this morning. Evelyn was in bed, snowed under with letters. Secretary, Carrados on the hearth rug. Well, now, Carrados said he'd be off to the city, came over to the bed, and gave her the sort of kiss a woman doesn't thank you for. Hand each side of her. He must have touched a letter under her pillow, because when he straightened up, it was in his right hand. Common-looking envelope, addressed in a sort of script. Letters like they print, only done by hand. Carrados said, Oh, one of your letters, my dear, putting it down on the counterpane. She turned white as a sheet, and she said, It's from one of my lame ducks. I must deal with it, and slid it under the others. Off he went, and that was that. Lord Robert jabbed at the letter in the file. Thing is, he said most emphatically, same sort of script. On my honour. Good Lord said Alain mildly. Coincidence stretches out a long arm, so does the law. Not such a very long arm, after all, if this pretty fellow is working among one class only, and it looks as if he is. Come in. A police constable marched in with a packet of letters. Half a moment while I have a look at my mail, Banshee, there may just be... Yes, by gum, there is. He opened an envelope, glanced at a short note, unfolded an enclosure, raised his eyebrows, and handed it to Lord Robert whistled Lord Robert. Unforeseen circumstances prevented collection on Monday night. Please leave bag with same sum down between seat and left-hand arm of blue sofa in concert room, 57 Constant Street, next Thursday afternoon. Mrs. Halkett Hackett, said Alain, explains that her unfortunate friend received this letter by yesterday evening's post. What's happening on Thursday at 57 Constant Street? Charity show. Chamber music. Bach. Sir Mione Quartet. I'm going. Bunchy, said Alan. Talk to Mrs. Halkett Hackett. Share the blue sofa with her. And when the austere delights of Bach knock at your heart, pay no attention but, with the very comment of your soul, Yes, 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 don't quote now, Roderick, or somebody may think you're a detective. Blast you, said Alan. Lord Robert gave a little crowing laugh and rose from his chair. <laughs> I'm off, he said. Alain walked with him into the corridor and stood looking after him as he walked away with small steps, a quaint, out-of-date figure. A few days after his visit to the yard, Lord Robert Gospel attended a cocktail party given by Mrs. Halkett Hackett for her protégé. This was one of the first large cocktail parties of the season, and there were as many as 250 guests there. Lord Robert adored parties and was in tremendous demand as a chaperone's partner could be depended on to help with those unfortunate children of seventeen who, in spite of all the efforts of finishing school, dressmakers, hairdressers, and their unflagging mothers, were apt to stand alone nervously smiling on the outskirts of groups. With these unhappy debutants, Lord Robert took infinite trouble. He would tell them harmless little stories, and when they laughed, would respond as if they themselves had said something amusing. 
His sharp little eyes would search about for younger men than himself, and he would draw them into a group round himself and the girl. The wariest and most conceited young men were always glad to be seen talking to Lord Robert, and the debutante would find herself the only girl in a group of men who were enjoying themselves. Her nervous smile would vanish, and when Lord Robert saw her eyes grow bright, he would slip away. But in the plain protégé of General and Mrs. Halkett Hackett, he met his Waterloo. Lord Robert was greeted by Mrs. Halkett Hackett, who looked a little older than usual, and by her husband the General, a notable fire-eater. Lord Robert twinkled at him and passed on into the thick of the party. Then he saw the plain protégé. She had just met a trio of incoming debutants and had taken them to the right side of the room. They all spoke politely and pleasantly to her, but without any air of intimacy. He saw her linger a moment while they were drawn into the whirlpool of high-pitched conversation, then she turned away and stood looking towards the door. She seemed utterly lost. Lord Robert crossed the room and greeted her with his old-fashioned bow. How do you do? This is a good party, he said with a beaming smile. Oh, oh, I'm so glad. She was staring, he noticed, at her chaperone, and he saw that Mrs. Halkett Hackett was talking to a tall, smooth man with a heavy face and a proprietary manner. Do tell me, he said, who is that man with our hostess? It's Captain Withers. Ah, thought Lord Robert. Aloud, he said, Withers? Then it's not the same fella. Rather thought I knew him. Oh, said the protégé. She had turned her head slightly, and he saw that she now looked at the general. The general had borne down upon his wife and Captain Withers and glared for three seconds at Captain Withers, who smiled, bowed, and moved away. The general then spoke to his wife, and, for a fraction of a second, the terror that shone in the protégé's eyes was reflected in the chaperones. Then she turned to greet a new arrival, who Lord Robert saw with pleasure was Lady Alain. She was followed by a thin girl with copper-coloured hair and slanting eyebrows that at once reminded him of his friend Roderick. Must be the niece, he decided. The girl at his side murmured an excuse and hurried away to greet Sarah Allen. In a few minutes, Lord Robert was surrounded by acquaintances and was embarked upon one of his stories. He made his point, drifted away on a wave of laughter, and found Lady Allen. My dear Bunchy, she said, the very person I hope to see. Come and gossip with me. I feel like a phoenix. You look like a princess, he said. Good heavens! How everybody screams! How old are you, Bunchy? Fifty-five, my dear. I'm sixty-five. Do you find people very noisy nowadays, or are you still too much for chicken? I enjoy parties awfully, but I agree that there ain't much repose in modern intercourse. That's it, said Lady Allen. No repose, all the same. I like the moderns. As Roderick says, they finish their thoughts. We only did that in the privacy of our bedrooms, and very often asked forgiveness of our creator for doing it. The cocktail party surged politely about them. The noise, the smoke, the festive smell of flowers and alcohol seemed to increase every moment. Apparently all the guests had arrived. Mrs. Halkett Hackett was moving into the room. This was his chance. He turned round and found himself face to face with Captain Withers. Withers was a tall man and a fine, arrogant figure. Lord Robert, a plump and comical one. But it was Lord Robert who seemed the more dominant and more dignified. Oh, ah, how do you do? said Captain Withers very heartily. Good evening, said Lord Robert, and turned back to Lady Allen. Captain Withers walked quickly away. Why, Bunchy, said Lady Allen. Never seen you snub anybody. Do you know who that was? No. A fellow called Morris Withers. Throwback to my foreign office days. He's frightened of you. I hope so, said Lord Robert. I'll trot along and pay my respects to the hostess. Will you dine with me one evening? Bring Roderick. I'm so busy with Sarah. May we ring you up? If it can be managed, it must be. Au revoir. Goodbye, Banshee. He picked his way through the crowd to Mrs. Halkett Hackett. I'm on my way out, he said, but I hope to get a word with you. Perfectly splendid party. She called him... Dear Lord Robert, like a grand dame in a slightly dated comedy. Are you going to the show at the Constant Street Rooms on Thursday afternoon? he asked. I'm looking forward to that awfully. Her eyes went blank, but she scarcely paused before answering yes. 
I'll give myself the pleasure of looking out for you there, if it wouldn't bore you. Do tell me, I've just run into a fellow whose face looked as familiar as anything, but I can't place him. Fellow over there, talking to the girl in red. He saw the patches of rouge on her cheeks start up. Do you mean Captain Morris Withers? Maybe. The name don't strike a chord, though. Got a shocking memory. Better be getting along. Goodbye. Goodbye, dear Lord Robert, said Mrs. Halkett Hackett. He edged his way out and was waiting patiently for his hat and umbrella when someone at his elbow said, Hello, Uncle Bunch. You going home? Lord Robert turned and saw his nephew. What? Oh, it's you, Donald. Yes, I am. Want a lift? Yes, please, said Donald. His nephew seemed rather agitated. Together they went out into the street and found a taxi. Lord Robert twisted himself round and looked at his nephew. What's up? he asked. I... well, I... I'm in a bit of a tight corner, Uncle Bunch. What is it? Gambling? Well, yes. Racing? Cards? Uh, a bit, but actually I dropped the worst packet at roulette. Good gad! exclaimed Lord Robert with surprising violence. Where the devil do you play roulette? At a house out at Leatherhead. It belongs to a man who was at that party. I mean, it's not run for anything but fun, and Captain Withers simply takes on the bank. I paid all right, but... But it just about cleaned me up. You're shying about, said Lord Robert. What's the real trouble? One of my checks has been returned. I'm bust. I paid your Oxford debts and started you off with five hundred as a yearly allowance. Are you telling me you've gone through five hundred since you came down? I'm sorry, said Donald. Yes. Your mother gives you four pounds a week, don't you? Yes. Lord Robert suddenly whisked out a notebook. How much was this returned cheque? Fifty quid. Who is it made out to? To Wits. Withers. I had a side bet with him. What's the address? Shackleton House, Leatherhead. Any other debts? One or two shops. And a restaurant or two. The taxi drew up and they entered the house in silence. Lord Robert sat at his desk and wrote a cheque. You still have the same mind about this doctoring? he asked. Passed some examination for it, didn't you? Medical prelim, said Donald easily. Yes, I've got that. I'll get you out of this mess on one condition. You'll start work at Edinburgh as soon as they'll have you. If that's not at once, I'll get a coach, and you'll go to archery and work there. I'll allow you as much as the usual student gets, and I'll advise your mother to give you no more. That's all. But I don't want to go to Edinburgh for my training. I want to go to Thomas's. You're better away from London. There's one other thing I must absolutely insist upon, Donald. You are to drop this fellow with us. The fellow's a bad un. I know something about him. I have never interfered in the matter of your friendships before, but I'd be neglecting my duty if I didn't step in here. I won't give up a friend simply because you choose to say he's no good, and I won't go and stay in a deserted mausoleum of a Scotch house in the middle of the season. There's... there's Bridget. Lady Carados's girl seems a nice creature. She'll wait for you. I won't go. You can keep your filthy money. By God, I'll borrow from someone who's not a bloody complacent Edwardian relic, and I'll get a job and pay them back as I can, bawled Donald and flung out of the room. Lord Robert sighed. At last he pulled an envelope towards him, and in his finicky writing addressed it to Captain Withers, Shackleton House, Leatherhead. Then he wrote a short note, folded a cheque, and put them both into the envelope. He rang for his butler. Will you see that this letter is posted immediately? Lord Robert had sat on the blue sofa since 2.15, but he was not tired of it. He enjoyed watching the patrons of music arriving, and he explored the blue sofa, sliding his hands cautiously over the surface of the seat and down between the seat and the arms. A number of people came and spoke to him, among them Lady Carados, who was looking tired. You are overdoing it, Evelyn, he told her. Rather suit you, being so fine drawn, but you're too thin, you know. Where's Bridgie? At a matinee. Oh, there's Lady Alain. We're supposed to be together. Goodbye, Banshee. Goodbye, Evelyn. Don't worry too much over anything. She gave him a startled look and went away. Lord Robert looked restlessly towards the door and saw Sir Daniel Davidson, who made straight for him. Ah, he said as he shook hands. I might have guessed I should find you here, doing the fashionable thing for the unfashionable reason. Music, my God.